remember one Christmas break in, I think, 8th grade. I watched a whole bunch of different anime. Back then, it was an achievement to me. My lack of social life aside, one of the shows that I watched was Daybreak Illusion. Now that I'm older, my tastes have matured, and I have a bit more of a critical eye for media, I've decided to watch this again instead of Castlevania. Clearly, I make good life choices. By Studio AIC, who also did Now and Then, Here and There, Daybreak Illusion started airing on July 6, 2013. It features a cast of brightly colored characters battling against horrific abominations, which is exactly what I want from the media that I consume. The main gimmick of the series is its focus on tarot cards. For anyone who doesn't know, tarot cards originate from the mid-15th century and were originally just an ordinary set of playing cards. However, over time they came to be used as a tool for fortune telling and that's how they're primarily known today. I even have a deck of my own, see? They're super pretty. I like the art. It's been two years since the death of 12-year-old, remember that, Akari's mother. And it is on that day that she discovers the secret that her mother kept hidden. Inheriting the power of the sun card, Akari must learn how to use the elemental tarot to defeat monsters called demonia. She goes to Sephiro Flore, a secret organization dedicated to exterminating these monsters. Demonia are born from negative human emotion, and we've all seen this kind of monster concept before. The question be, is it done well here? Sort of? It's a little confusing. We're told a person makes some form of contract with a demon, and we see that happen. But it's also compared to a virus, which I guess also works because the demon man is the one doing the contracting, but a virus would be more like a person gets corrupted, then that person corrupts another person, and so on and so forth, but I'm overthinking this. Anyway, we're given the basic plot, we have a couple of establishing and character building episodes, and we're on our way. There's some magic world building exposition that's not very well explained at all, but we'll take a look at that later. The characters are good enough for what they are, but there isn't really much beyond what we see. We have the energetic one, the shy one, the stoic one, the protagonist, but let's look into them still. Akari is the new girl. She's the main character and she has a big heart, is well-spoken, and tries to be friendly. She's actually able to hear the voices of the demonia, which cause her to struggle in the beginning with the duty of killing them. But I actually really like how they handled this aspect, because those who become demonia and then are defeated are completely erased from this world. All memory of them is gone, like they never existed. But they did exist, and these girls are the only ones who remember. Akari resolves herself to remember the final words of those unfortunate people. What she constantly thinks back to is Fuyuna, who became a demonia and went after her. She's the one person whose voice she wasn't able to hear, and that lack of closure haunts her, which is why she drives herself to listen to others. That's a really neat concept to explore. All of that is in contrast to no-nonsense Seira, who simply wants to exterminate the demonia. Initially, she's very cold and dismissive of Akari, saying that the people who turn into demonia are worthless and deserve to be forgotten. This naturally upsets Akari because her cousin was one of those people. The two of them have a super interesting dynamic that gets explored when Seira befriends a girl who then later becomes a demonia. It's after that that she lowers her guard and starts to open up. All the while, Luna looks on in a silent jealousy. Luna is the quiet one, acting very shy and timid, but she's also the one who reaches out to Akari the most. Mainly due to a very one-sided crush that I don't think is really well written. Like, before Akari even speaks, Luna's acting all blushy, and their actual first conversation is when Luna decides to lay down next to Akari while she's sleeping, which is kind of super weird. Also, something something throwaway line about Akari reminding Luna of her long-lost twin sister... whatever. And then there's Ginka. She's the energetic one who keeps the team's spirits up. 
She grew up poor, but now her father's super successful, and Ginka herself fights the demonia to earn money. Even though it's not really established that the girls get paid for their work, but I guess we just don't need to question that. And that's all we really got for Ginka, which is really sad. I remember when I first watched it, she was my favorite. She does have one big defining moment, but we'll get to that in a bit. I will say that I do like watching them just hanging out and being friends. It's interesting to see their individual relationships to one another as well as in a group. Like how Seira and Ginka are often standing next to each other because before Luna came along it was just the two of them. Then there's Akari and Seira who come together and understand one another. And of course, there's Luna and Akari, who both struggle a lot with their job, but find some understanding and solace in one another. But really, watching this a second time, they never felt particularly close. Like, we see them interact, but there's never an actual bond being formed. There's no chemistry. Luna was handled terribly, and she deserved better. Aside from the main four, we have these three babies who apparently represent the Wheel of Fortune. I only found that out while looking things up for this. Then there are the leaders of the Japanese branch of Saphir Flore, Ariel, who represents Judgment, and Atia, who represents the world. And finally, the two teachers, Meltina, the Magician, and Priscilla, the Fool. And I never really got much out of any of these characters. The most I can say is that Meltina and Priscilla give me huge lesbian vibes, and I know my own kind when I see it. Their characters serve their purpose within the narrative, but outside of the main four, it's hard to put any personality traits to them without sounding generic. Special mention to this fortune-telling trio, though. They show up at the beginning as the people who run the fortune-telling house that Akari volunteers at. And then later on in the cooldown episode, the girls stay over there for a night. I don't think they have individual names. And the designs of these two are pretty stereotypical and probably offensive in some manner. But as characters, they made me smile every time. So, there's a lot going on. And absolutely nothing gets explained in the slightest. As I've said before, the demonia are both a virus that spreads from person to person and something that happens when a person is approached by a demon man and they make a contract. Both of these are thrown out more like theories rather than actual fact. And then there's the fact that the characters only fight using the major arcana of the tarots, and only one person can have the power of a card at a time, meaning that at any given moment, only 22 members can exist. How does a worldwide organization spanning presumably centuries operate with only 22 people? Not only that, but not all of them even fight. Then there's the fact that this organization doesn't feel like it's been around for a long time. It feels like it only just started existing a little before the plot happens. Considering that no one knows anything about the monsters they fight, it all feels very spur of the moment and just kind of random. Halfway through, we're introduced to the anti-cards. See, tarot cards have two interpretations, positive and negative, one right side up and the other reversed. The whole basis of the magic system is that there were two sets of magic cards that came from the same source, one used by the heroes and the other used by the demonia. But the anti-cards are specifically, like, a clone of the main girl? The only one we really get to see says a bunch of stuff about existing eternally, which doesn't have anything to do with Ginka herself. And once Ginka and her clone vanish, the concept of anti-cards sort of follows behind. We do see Priscilla and Meltina running into their anti-cards, but then they get rescued and the concept is never seen again. Just has no one ever encountered an anti-card before? There's one line about the demonia purposefully not sending out the anti-cards in an act of self-preservation, but... Does that mean that they're intelligent? Are they organized? Th there are a lot of things here that contradict one another. Also, apparently, Saphir Flore isn't the only secret organization. 
It's actually headed by another faceless organization called Laguziaro, who we also know nothing about. What we do know about Laguziaro is that they're also ordering around Cerebrum, the demonia who makes contracts with people. Also, it's implied that Cerebrum is sort of Akari's father, which means that he could have only existed for at most 12 years. Who was making the demonia before then? What is... Like, what? What? <laughs> oh, some minor stuff about Luna's vaguely terrible rich family and her sister who vanished without a trace. I know there's more stuff that baffles me, but I can't think of it right now. So let's get on to the super gross stuff. Yay! As I've gotten older, I've become more and more aware and upset by the depictions of young girls in anime. As a kid around 14, I saw characters like Luna and thought, yeah, that's just like me, and people can't help how their bodies develop. And that's true. But now, as a 21-year-old woman, I look at this and I think, oh, no. Because I recognize that this isn't the case of someone just happening to look like that. I recognize that an adult designed this character, drew her in this way, and I also will assume that the same person also designed her wolf form, and I really, really hope I don't need to state the problem with this. She has the fucking nipple bump I would like to cease existence now! Luna's chest actually wasn't much of a bother because it wasn't ever in the spotlight outside of her wolf form. But all throughout the show, there were several camera angles and shots that just made me super suspicious. If you want a good example of a teenage character with a noticeable chest that isn't sexualized, Mommy from Madoka Magica. Now she was someone I wanted to emulate as a teen. There's a level of confidence that comes from her, but never does the camera linger on her chest. At least in the original series, because other Madoka media love to do that, but we're moving on. Then there's the whole plot for the latter half of the series, centering around Cerebrum, wanting to impregnate Akari. By the way, do you remember how old- She's 12! She's 12! This strange man is trying to make a 12-year-old girl into a mother! Fucking ew! I mean, at least it's done through some magical bullshit ritual device thing or something, but she's 12! And the motivation isn't even the sex! He explicitly wants her to be a mom by force, and there is so much to unpack there, and I'm just not, I don't want to touch it. <sighs> And here's the important distinction. This does not come off as a villain doing a villain thing. It's shock value. Because the villain, Cerebrum, doesn't really have that much motivation behind him. We know literally nothing about the Demonia, and the story so far has done nothing to justify this extremely gross plot point. Then there's Akari being half Demonia because her father was studying them and then he became infected and then vanished and then her mom was pregnant, which is why she can understand the Demonia. Also, remember, she's 12! And the implication of this being her father! Send help! Ah! This is not a well thought out plot point with horrific implications. This is just bad writing for the sake of making the story dark without any actual meaning. Nothing is being said about these terrible, terrible things. The only reason they are included within the story is to tell us that the villain is bad, which we already knew because he steals people's souls and turns them into monsters. The back half could have been Cerebrum trying to get Akari to murder a basket of puppies and it would have gotten the same effect. It's... Ugh. When I was 14, I watched this and thought, Wow, it's so dark and fucked up. That means it's good. But it doesn't mean that's good. It means it's just dark and fucked up. That has nothing to do with the quality. Cerebrum hates people and also says some standard magical girl villain dialogue about never really being able to understand one another. But he wants to perpetuate his species, a species we never really see. 
Also, doesn't he already do that by infecting humans? Are there other demonia like him? What about the anti-cards? What is this weird void world we're in? Why does the plot of the finale revolve around whether or not a 12-year-old gives birth? Fuck! That's honestly the worst part of the show. Daybreak Illusion isn't anything special. It's not a must-watch, but if you're just looking for something to sit down and be like, Oh, that's cool. Turn your brain off, maybe. Yeah, it's... It, it's just kind of there. And with that, I have taken a swing at one of the many post-Madoka Magical Girl shows that I have very strong opinions about. Now I kind of want to do this again with other shows that fall into that category. So, join me next time, whenever that is. My name is Cake, and I watch bad Magical Girl anime so you don't have to. Bye!